Welcome, digital pathology trailblazers. Today, I have a super special guest for me personally, because this is the person who inspired me to even start a digital pathology place. Learn about the newest digital pathology trends in science and industry, meet the most interesting people in the niche, and gain insights relevant to your own projects. Here is where pathology meets computer science. You are listening to the Digital Pathology Podcast with your host, Dr. Alexandra Jura. And for everybody who ever searched for anything digital pathology related, his website is going to pop up as the first resource. Dr. Keith Kaplan, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. It was great meeting you in person in New York over the summer, and I'm glad that we're able to pull this together after so many years now. So I appreciate that. Uh, the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Amazing. And yes, we met in person. Keith, let's start with you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, probably everybody knows you already, but for those who are new to the digital pathology journey, let me know how you started, what's your background, and what do you do now? So I'm Keith Kaplan. I'm a surgical pathologist uh, with Versant Diagnostics. Versant Diagnostic uh, owns several pathology groups in Illinois, Maine, and Virginia currently. Uh, we are part of several groups in the Chicago land area, born and raised in Chicago. Did my medical school at Northwestern University here downtown and attended uh, medical school on an Army health profession scholarship. So I did my internship residency and then subsequently fellowships at AFIP in Washington, D.C. And that'll be a kind I of an I studied there for my boards. Okay. Uh, it was a great place. It was a great place to train, great experience. And then um, fortunately, I did my payback all at Walter Reed. So I spent nine years active duty military um, without ever leaving the Beltway. It was a great experience. I was exposed to great people and great cases and great colleagues, uh, many of whom I'm still in touch with today. So, and part of that actually led to my uh, introduction, certainly to social media and, and starting the blog. So, um, and currently, as I said, in private practice in Chicago now. And you started working digitally, but we're going to get to that in the later part of the podcast. But yeah, how did you get introduced to the digital world? Was your blog the first one? When did you start tissue pathology? So everybody who doesn't know, go to tissuepathology.com. And this is the blog we're talking about. This is the trend setting pathology blog uh, that was there when I started my digital pathology journey. And this was what inspired me to start my blog then later, you know, grew into um, more audio and podcast heavy and video heavy social presence, uh, social media presence and internet presence. But yeah, tissuepathology.com. How did this happen? You know, it's interesting. Uh, as I said, when we lived in D.C., there was actually a blog that I came across probably around 2003 or 2004 called whyihatedc.com. And uh, we didn't live in the district, but I worked in the district and you know we would go downtown and whatnot. And uh, he, he was ranting and raving about life in DC, traffic, parking, uh, taxation without representation, um, all of the issues in, in a large metropolitan area. Um, but interestingly, the way I came across that wasn't on the web, but actually in an article in the Washington Post. I think it was on page two or three of the, the section B, the, the metro section. Um, and they were writing about this blog. And I thought that's kind of interesting. We were still calling them web blogs as sort uh -huh. of article websites or chronological diaries of information usually done by individuals. And I thought this is really interesting that the Washington Post, and I enjoy reading the newspaper to today, certainly did at that time, was covering this blog. And actually, you know, aside from talking about what the blog was about, the article went on to say that, and this was a couple of years, if you remember, before the first iPhones, for example, in 2007, so we didn't have the power of mobile computing then, for sure. But the idea of Web 1.0, where you would bookmark sites and follow people, and people were starting to share ideas and contents, the Washington Post article went on to say that, you know, with these platforms and these technologies, 
everyone can be a pseudo journalist and write their opinions. People are going to have the opportunity to be photo journalists and put together their own photo essays. People are going to be able to, virtually everyone in the whole world could be their own food critic, their own music critic, their own movie critic. And we would share all of these ideas. And I thought it was just very interesting that here was somebody, I had no idea what his credentials were. And, you know, that's a separate issue, but that he was writing about this stuff and the Washington Post took notice of that. So I started thinking about how can I use these tools and technologies um, in pathology and certainly and we'll get back to this emerging technologies and pathology because we actually were doing some digital imaging, not whole slide, but we were mm -hmm. starting to dip a toe in the water with robotic telepathology actually in the military at I that know. time. I have this timeline where it says that AFIP decided to do robotic telepathology for the people who were deployed, right? Who were Correct. Uh, basically fighting in the field. So my introduction to digital pathology sort of had an unusual beginning. Um, as a senior resident, I was um, selected to be awarded an award from the American Association of Clinical Chemistry for an article that we wrote on laboratory indicators of ethanol consumption. And um, I had to ask permission and get funding to go out to San Francisco to the AACC meeting, which I really honestly had no other business being at. Um, to get this award. And um, I did so. And after after the award ceremony, I walked the large convention center there in San Francisco. And there were all the chemistry analyzers and reagent companies and people selling cuvettes and all of the things associated with clinical chemistry. It was big, big floor plan and lots of machines and equipment and people and so forth. But off in the corner of the convention center were a couple of people who looked to be about my age then, about 25 years ago. Um, on a small tabletop, and they had a computer set up. And somewhat naively, I just walked up to this table, and I happened to grab the mouse, and I moved a picture around on the screen. And I said, what just happened? And they said, you just drove a microscope slide 300 miles away in our shop in Newport Beach, California. And I said, I think the Army needs about 24 of these. So that was my first introduction to robotic telepathology. And actually, even before that, we had had old Apollo Karabi telesystems um, that were largely in pieces and boxes underneath the IHC bench by that point. But the, the Army had tried this, and they had tried it actually decades ago. Karabi, earlier. like the, the company by Dr. Weinstein? Correct. Like, what, Oh my right. goodness, this is like me doing history research on digital pathology. And that's like at the very, very beginning of the timeline, like in the 80s, where he was showing, uh, it was still, uh, it wasn't even digital, it was just telepathology because it was uh, satellite, right? Satellite, it was video and satellite, and they had some proof of concept between El Paso and D.C., as early as 1986, I think, if I remember the history mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dr. Weinstein had been doing things between MGH and Logan Airport a decade or two before that. So yeah, that, that system that was in pieces and boxes was actually a Karabi telemetric system at the old Walter Reed Hospital. And we tried to put that back together. We didn't quite get there. But then I saw motorized stage, motorized objectives through a company called Illumia that became Trestle and then, and then Clarient and then Zeiss, I believe. And um, it was probably technology, quite frankly, ahead of its time at that point, because this was late 90s. A lot of us weren't even accustomed to online banking. Um, we had very primitive communication systems. And pathologists were pretty wary about exchanging information over the web and rendering diagnoses based on uh, a slide hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. But that came over time, of course, and, and we're well far down the road from that now. So um, I was introduced to dynamic telepathology um, at that point and brought that back to the Army. And um, eventually we deployed 24 systems all over the world, and they were all uh, being directed towards AFIP. And then folks were consulting with each other with those systems across the um, Army Medical Department network.
Did you use them? Were you using them on the regular? Yeah, basis? yeah. We did a number of consults at Walter Reed, and we used it for our resident and fellowship training. And I think when I left AFIP in um, 2005, something like 2,400 cases had traveled across the uh, Army telepathology network that we had started. So that was 2003. You're saying that when I left, it was 2005, and unfortunately. Um, that coincided with the base realignment and closing and the eventual closure of AFIP. Um, but mm-hmm. between effectively 2000 and 2005, the cases that were formal consults to AFIP, we could track. And then folks who had trained together or knew each other could share cases, sharing each other's static IP addresses with their microscopes. Um, so we had them in all the teaching programs. We had them in Korea. We had several in Germany. We actually deployed a system to Iraq during the Gulf War. And that system actually uh, had a slide loader. I wrote a paper about this, had a slide loader associated with it because we set up a histology lab at the 31st Combat Support Hospital. So we were doing telepathology from Iraq. And it, you know, it's interesting. And this is a lesson learned about digital pathology today. For and those who are watching today. on YouTube, I'm like slowly, slowly opening my mouth more and more when I hear these stories. <laughs> the history is fascinating, actually. And Toby Cornish and I and others have, re- have written the history about this um, and the experience. AFIP had talked about doing this, as I say, decades and decades ago, but the technology wasn't necessarily available or reliable. So um, the advent of uh, being able to do dynamic telepathology kind of changed the, the the workflow a little bit because if you were going to send me a case, you could call me, text me, email me and say, hey, can you open up your browser and point it to my microscope and take a look at this case? As opposed to a mail-in service where you mail in the slides with a letter, dear Keith, and then it comes here and I look at it when I have a minute to look at it. So is this instant sort of real-time consultation between pathologists. So it's great for the referring pathologist, maybe a little bit more demanding for the consulting pathologist in terms of being on the hook real time and dealing with time zones with Korea and Europe and so forth. But um, so we had had that experience um, in terms of telepathology and the first whole slide systems were just coming out then. And I think everyone recognized that, you know, um, as I said, back in 2003, I think this was going to be the holy grail of digital pathology. And certainly the dynamic has its place as it still does for frozen sections or intraoperative assessments of cytology, but in terms of high volume throughput, full slide imaging. Mm -hmm. So basically uh, that was 2005, then 15 years later, uh, the pandemic comes and you already lived through this workflow. That was like, did you think like, oh, that's what we're going to be doing now? Or were you surprised? Or like, what was your, what were your thoughts when uh, there was the, you couldn't come to, to the hospital anymore? Uh, you know, we weren't fully digital by then, but I know that it probably sped up the adoption for a number of folks. And I think, you know, the lessons we've learned since then um, from uh, the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services and other public health agencies that it was safe and effective to use um, got us over a pretty significant hurdle. You know, one of the reasons I started tissue pathology back in 2007 is we saw that there was already a little bit of clash between what the technology could do and what regulators said we could do with it. And this whole idea of using it for quote unquote primary diagnosis, you could see was already going to be kind of a troublesome issue. We hadn't even got Mm -hmm. to clinical business practices, we hadn't addressed reimbursement, but we knew that there was going to be an issue somewhat analogous to radiology, although I think they had a better path to certification, but there was going to be an issue. So it was a kind of an easy target, if you will, in terms of FDA clearance for whole slide imaging systems. And that was my platform to discuss what those issues were and bring those to the forefront and try to push that envelope forward a little bit in the way that I could with our tissuepathology.com messaging. Mm -hmm. So how did you start? You just like set up a website and started writing 
your yeah. opinions on on things. I remember I somehow dug out your old uh, old articles there, and it was. I don't know from when it was, but it was on the first uh, scanners that were coming out and basically you going or, or, or giving people your uh, impression from a conference about um, about the new technology coming up. So h- how did you start? Yeah, so after, after, I, after I recognized that the Washington Post was writing about blogs, I became interested, although I didn't really act on that much. When I um, took my first job here in Chicago, when I um, left the military in 2005, there was actually a physician in that healthcare system who wrote an anonymous newsletter um, and would rant and rave about the administration and different specialties. And, um, you know, I thought that the lesson learned from that was if you're going to do that, you have to be very transparent. You have to own it. You have, you can't do it anonymously. So if I were to write something, regardless of what it was, if it was on fishing or model trains or pathology, you had to you had to be very transparent. So that was actually kind of a good lesson learned. And at that hospital at the time, there was actually a cardiologist who had a blog and he was sharing EKGs. I thought that was kind of interesting. He was an interventional cardiologist. So he was sharing EKGs and talking about EP procedures and thought this is kind of interesting, um, but really didn't do much. And, um, you know, to answer your, one of your previous questions, actually, Bruce Friedman from the University of Michigan had a blog called Lab Soft News. Um, and I had met him years prior at the informatics conferences in Pittsburgh in the late 90s. And um, so here was, I think, probably by then a professor emeritus at the University of Michigan doing this. I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And um, the College of American Pathologists had reformed um, a conference called uh, CAP Futurescape, which happened to be here in Chicago in 2007. And Bruce and I met and talked and he basically dared me um, to start a blog. And he said that, you know, he would pay for the first several months hosting on uh, the platform then, which was TypePad. That's going way back. And um, I don't even know if WordPress existed. And um, Are you and on Yep, I use WordPress now, but back then we were we were all on TypePad, which was a very primitive sort of um, primitive formats and backgrounds and things, and very little customization. But it was it did the trick, and so uh, Bruce dared me to do it. We talked about it at Futurescape, and um, that summer, then in two thousand seven, um, I started it. The other the other sort of lesson learned getting into private practice at that point, uh, we were a hospital owned group. We had, uh, obviously, we had our clinician colleagues, we had pathology colleagues, we had administration, um, we had all the trials and tribulations of the practice of medicine. And I realized, you know, physicians are pretty highly regulated creatures. We have Mm -hmm. state requirements, we have local requirements, hospital requirements. If I ever wanted to do something, get a research approval, that that was a committee. If you wanted some new equipment, that was a committee. So there was a lot of regulation and control um, then there was spousal approval needed for certain things. So I thought, well, maybe if I sit at my keyboard here, um, this is something that doesn't require any approval, no board approval, no Oh my approval. goodness, Keith, you're saying this and you're basically mimicking my um, like logic, like this or, or last year's logic when I was like, oh, I would like to contribute more to my community of toxicologic pathologists. And like you say, everything has to be approved by educational committee, by I don't know, and then it doesn't fit in the newsletter, and then it has to go somewhere else to the paper, and then it has to be peer reviewed. And I'm like, how about I just make a video about it? Right. right. And then just share it with people, and if they want to watch, they can watch. Right. And you know, and the, and as you probably have, as you probably learned, maybe maybe your maybe your curve wasn't as as steep. Um, But I I will say probably, you know, the summer of 2007, maybe for the first six months, it's it's it felt like I spent a lot of time talking to myself. Yeah, I think it always feels like that when you start followers and likes and comments and it takes some time to get discovered and build up your audience. So as I as I told other folks who have since followed, some of which uh, no longer do it, if you're going to do it, you know, it's probably six to 12 months at least in my experience, to kind of build up your following and get noticed, have the vendors notice you, 
um, and start to gain some traction. So, um, yeah, that first six months, it was a lot of talking to myself, but it was, you know, the ability after signing out cases to just have my time and to think about things and whether it was the interesting case of the day or um, something politely, politically correct, diplomatically about the hospital or the healthcare system, again, being fully transparent, owning what I said, being mindful of not biting the hand that feeds you, but criticizing it, um, I think, you know, was helpful to me in terms of other forms of personal and professional um, development. Um, and something actually, um, I don't, I don't know if I've ever written about this that much, but um, in medical school, a colleague and I started uh, a school newspaper, which actually, uh, I think, ended during COVID, unfortunately. But in Northwestern, we started a newspaper called The Beat, and it had a little EKG logo on it. He became a cardiologist. He was the uh, self-proclaimed um, editor, and he would write medical articles. And uh, I remember he was interested in cardiology, and he um, spent a lot of time talking about uh, anti-cholesterol uh, drugs, cholesterol-lowering drugs. Lipitor was very popular. We participated in Lipitor studies. And uh, my job was to write other articles. And so fortunately, I had the uh, Chicago Bulls teams of the 90s to write about and Michael Jordan and basketball championships. So I was kind of the sports guy. And um, I, also sold the, I also sold the advertising to pay for the darn thing. Um, ah, and the so see, you had some experience already. So I went out, made up a little flyer, and I went out on Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago and got thrown out of Lord and & Taylor and Marshall Fields and Nordstrom's and was almost arrested for soliciting a few times. And um, <laughs> once having learned from that experience, I uh, you know, started selling to the dry cleaners and the barbers and getting coupons for student discounts. And then it became very popular and we were actually in the black uh, and we could print the newspaper on a regular basis, I think monthly. Um, so I wanted to get back to that. I, I hadn't had that in the 10 years there. And um, it was fun to just sit down and write and pontificate. And, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a ton of mistakes, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, you learn from your mistakes. If you can do that, then you can move on. So. This is so cool. So was selling, was it difficult for you when you started selling the newspaper? It was. I, as I say, I took the completely wrong approach. I didn't understand the market. I didn't, I didn't understand that going into uh, large department retail stores was not a good market for a student-run uh, medical school publication. But then I figured out that, and I had a paper route as a kid, and I, so, I sort of probably should have understood this wrapping those papers and seeing who they were advertising to and what was being advertised. But um, once I understood who the market was and who the target was, and I could get them to buy space for coupons or discounts or buy one, get one at the sandwich shops around campus, that sort of thing. And they could see some return on their cost um, mm -hmm. for these coupons and these advertising it became very successful, you know, going into Nordstrom's and Lord and Taylor, trying to sell a student run healthcare uh, newspaper wasn't the right target. So, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but did you apply those lessons then to uh, your business of tissuepathology.com? Because then, you know, it always starts as, as like a passion project. And then when it once it gets traction, it um, kind of attracts enough attention, like the newspaper, there is content and uh, people want to be shown next to this content. So how did it turn into business? Did you even intend it to be a business at some point or did it turn into one organically? I had no intention of doing so. I had no idea that it could be monetized. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, I think a lot of folks who have tried to start since um, that I say have largely come and gone, I think started it with the intention of monetizing it. And I encourage them not to do that. You know, build up your content, you know, get 18 months worth of stuff in there to start to get the Google juice going and start to get discovered and shared and linked and all of those things. And then it'll happen. Um, and so, um, you know, for the first several years, there actually weren't any sponsors for the first two years. 
and then they started calling me and saying, mm-hmm. and this is pretty funny, actually, started saying, how much is it to sponsor your blog? And I, the first time I had, was asked that question, I said, what's a sponsor? Um, and, and a marketing person said, you know, when you go to the basketball game or the baseball game and you see the Pepsi sign or the Coca-Cola sign, that's a sponsor. I said, oh, I said, I don't know. I don't know what it's worth. So that was all, as you say, very organic, um, mm-hmm. and largely inbound marketing. Um, but one thing that you have probably found, and if you haven't yet, I'm, I'm certain that you will. The one of the deliverables, if anybody wants to start up a blog, um, competition is healthy. The um, one of the major um, lessons learned or subsequent um, deliverables of having a social media presence, a virtual or online presence, is that you start to get invited to give talks, to attend meetings. Mm -hmm. Somehow along the way, you become a key opinion leader. You become a thought leader. And, um, you know, as you will see, if you haven't already, you don't have to be right all the time. You just kind of have to put put it out there with your thoughts, your your coherent thoughts. You know, this is what I think and this is why I think it. Keyword coherent. Coherent. (laughs) Coherent. Yes. So you think, okay, well, you know, AI is going to save us all. That may not be right. That may not turn out to be right. Um, but as long as you can put together that argument, people are interested in that in terms of hearing that viewpoint. And then maybe you'll speak with somebody with a counter viewpoint. And so you, get, you start to get invited to attend meetings and um, give talks. And then that further actually leads to the business because people want to be associated with that presence and people, you know, kind of pushing the envelope and stimulating the discussion. Um, and again, you know, as I think it was Niels Bohr, quantum uh, physicist, Nobel winning quantum physicist, and perhaps Yogi Berra. You know, they said it's difficult to make predictions, particularly about the future. And so you're not always going to be right. And um, but I think having an opinion and trying to stimulate that discussion. And there's a great disparity, as we know, online between those who produce and those who consume. So there aren't a ton of people out there necessarily putting it out there not that they don't have an opinion they just don't share it mm-hmm. in that format it's work so. you know it's work to do it consistently i like slip off the wagon all the time but you know we keep coming back i like the like the theme um of what you're saying that uh, trans the transparency um honesty you know that it's your opinion that you stand by and that there are counter opinions and that's okay. And that's the point of, of putting stuff out there to spark a discussion and whatever this discussion is going to lead to. Um, in contrast to the examples you gave at the beginning that, you know, people were ranting uh, and that was the, because it's like easy to hook somebody with this, but it's definitely not a sustainable strategy in our profession and not something I would like to do either. No. Was yeah. the tech difficult? Was the tech of setting up an online thing for you difficult? And not only like the setting up, but also figuring out, okay, how does Google and search engine work? How like, you know, you can put a lot of stuff out there, but if it's not structured in a certain way, it's not going to show, um, it's it's not going to show let's say as it should um or at least not proportionally to to the content that it's out there tell me about your search engine optimization um learning curve and i'm asking um about that because your uh, platform is very much text based and this is what what the search engines i mean now we have ai so i don't yet know how it's going to change there's like you can have this generative search where it doesn't really point to a website um but yeah tell me about about being discoverable online with pathology content in general well it's interesting you know going back to 2007 um uh other platforms were in their infancy facebook was in its infancy um as i pointed out in a talk in 2008 there was an article in the economist at that time that said Twitter was not a viable business. 
because it had no revenue model. And Twitter would not survive another couple of years. And then it sold for 40 billion or something a couple of years right. ago. So um, there wasn't a whole lot known, I think. Once I started to get into it and started to say, um, and seeing actually after a few weeks and then a few months, people from South Africa, people from Australia, and not just people from down the street or inside the hospital getting noticed. I thought, okay, now what, what are they seeing? What are the triggers here? What is, what is bringing them to the site? And then what is getting them to subscribe to the email? And what is getting them to like the comments or reshare it on their sites? Um, and so the technical setting up, you're right, you know, not difficult because it was pretty primitive. But then I actually, by 2010, 2011, I remember meeting with quote unquote, SEO consultants and people who had started to look into this for text searches um, and textual information. And it's something that actually goes back to, you know, the late 90s when we were doing remote telepathology and the web was still in its infancy. I remember sitting in the resident room on, you know, probably a Windows 95 computer with a big CRT monitor and, and just kind of trying to figure out who's putting this information online and how reliable is it? I remember one night sitting there on call waiting for a frozen and I typed in um, Pelger Hewitt. I thought, no way anybody's ever heard of Pelger Hewitt and nobody's going to have any information about this. And um, sure enough, I type it in and there's pages of images and there's support groups for patients with Pelger Hewitt and there's publications about it. And there's atlases online with hematology images. I thought, okay, maybe that's a little unusual. Let's try May Heglin or Dolly Bodies. And it was the same thing. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. There's so much information, but is the information credible? Is the information reliable? I don't think we use the term disinformation probably as mm -hmm. much back then, if at all. But, you know, there's information and disinformation. So I wanted to make sure that what I was putting out was... Um, referenced, was sourced, and if it was opinion, that they, there was some foundation for those opinions. And so I just kind of stuck to that. I didn't try to plug in keywords or things mm -hmm. that they didn't fit to just try to get eyeballs. And then it grew. Again, just speaking about information in general, I love this quote by Mark Twain. He said, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you're misinformed. And some people would argue that today. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, again, what I was putting out there was referenced, was sourced, and I didn't try to put in things just to try to try to increase the mm -hmm. SEO score, the optimization. When I met with the consultants, they said, you know, you need to you need to have more images, you need to have more links, 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 links. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't bother to do that um, unless I felt it was necessary. So, you know, fortunately. There was enough good information, I guess, that people started to recognize it and follow it. And, you know, we still had RSS feed, so we had everybody had their RSS reader. And, you know, I could see who was signing up for an RSS feed. And we just turned that off several years ago now. But I know because I was I was part of it and then it stopped coming. Right. So, you know, now it's email and now it's on your phone and, you know, now it's mobile and. Those were in the days people would bookmark things and, you know, you would, and that was, I think, and I think you've done this very well. That was really pathology 1.0. That would maybe pathology 2.0, which I trademarked the idea of using web and social media to share information, content, exchange ideas. And as you say, you know, for better or for worse for the past 17 years, it's largely been textual. I haven't made the leap to audio video podcasts you have so the next generation okay, now you know this, your strength is probably text because i started as a blog and then i was struggling putting out consistent well-researched well-referenced articles because i mean i have some articles and now it's you know uh, easier to i try to write articles from blogs uh, from um sorry podcasts that have a content that lends itself to an article. But then when I started the podcast, I thought, oh, that's just so much easier for me. And also the format that I have is an interview podcast where I interview experts who are experts. And, you know, by that I learn 
and those conversations are just a lot easier for me to uh, produce this content. So that's why I gravitated very heavily to it was at the beginning it was just audio and then we just started recording videos as well and um, the YouTube presence started, which is a whole another game like YouTube SEO. I'm like, oh my goodness, I should start another degree in YouTube thumbnail cre- creation. <laughs> so but i'm i think i'm like you i'm like how about i just make a good video first and then right. we take it from there so i've just started getting into video creation the past couple of years uh train spotting railroads uh fishing videos with my gopro camera so i'm just now getting comfortable i think with editing and music and framing shots. So it's everything is an evolution. And, and, you know, I guess the bottom line is, I guess about 2010, Bruce Friedman and I and another blogger in Chicago here, Mark Poole, who had a, a site at the Daily Sign Out, we actually wrote a paper on 10 lessons learned as pathology bloggers. And I don't think they were in any... I need to link to that one in the show notes. I think it was in the Journal of Pathology Informatics in 2010. And I don't know if we ranked them in any particular order, but, you know, one of them was blogging is a discipline. It's, it's one more thing. It's just like your job and your daily chores and your responsibilities and paying your bills and showing up where you need to be on time. It's a discipline. And um, if you don't control that, you know, the, the blog will win or it will be neglected. And um, so you need to make those, you carve out that time and do that starts to become sort of a war of attrition, I think, you know, if you don't keep up with it. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's probably one of the key lessons I think you already recognize that content is key. And perhaps there's a place still for text. And I think certainly there's a place for um, the audio, the video, and the podcast. I've watched them of your podcasts and they're really great. And as I say, I'm honored to be here today to be a part of that. But Very this is definitely Pathology 3.0 now where we can talk to each other directly and share ideas and not just uh, comment on each other's posts and that sort of thing. So that you have to, you have to keep up with it. And, and I think through the years, content is key. And, you know, for both of us, really, there's a lot more competition than I certainly had back in 2007. I wasn't competing with Instagram. I wasn't competing with TikTok. I wasn't competing with Facebook and Meta. There was a lot less competition. There were millions of bloggers, but there was a lot less, you know, people just scrolling through endless streams of videos and clips and information. And, you know, and so I think one of the other key things, and I think you do this very well, is, is filtering out significant information from white noise and, you know, sticking to, you know, key concepts and um key thoughts and key thought leaders and what's happening in the market currently. And I think if you continue to do that, it will be very successful. That is my plan. And thank you so much for those words of encouragement. So let's transition from the blog and the publishing platform to your practice, because recently, uh, as I learned from an article on LinkedIn, you started signing up digitally. And uh, my like when I was um, crafting my questions, um, I thought, huh, that's interesting. He didn't practice digitally before. And now he's practicing. Is it a big challenge? But now after you told me the story with the telepathology and all the other things, it's like, okay, it's just the normal next thing to do but still tell me your impressions um tell me how it is to sign up digitally yeah so it's a project that actually went back to probably 2017 uh looking at scanners in the core lab selecting a vendor thinking about uh deploying this who would get it network issues um hospital heterogeneity dealing with different hospitals within the core lab network and then uh, was probably upended a little bit by COVID in terms of just physically getting into places to set up servers and computers and monitors. Um, and so we went live last May uh, with the Philips IntelliSight Pathology Solution. The core lab has eight Philips scanners. And um, I think, as I said in that article, most of us are doing, I think, about 80% of our work now um, digitally because there's a greater geographic distance now between the core lab and the hospitals. Most of us had our own histology lab across the hall where maybe there wasn't as much of a business case, but now with consolidation and um, maximizing resources, 
it makes good business sense to do that. Obviously, hematology and cytology cases were not part of the FDA clearance, so we clearance don't do those that system. way. So I still have, I think, as you can see, a microscope on my desk. The microscope um, is there's there. still a slide file back there for the old stuff. Um, and so um, but about 80 percent is digitally. It was a very strange sort of set of occurrences. Uh, we went to a new lab information system, although same vendor and largely the same platform. Uh, we went digital and then we also went to voice recognition. So we yes. eliminated in-house transcription services. Tell me so about we went that. From, well, you know, we went from the microscope to a foot pedal to paperwork and slides to a desk that has much less stuff on it um, and a big monitor and uh, no and less microscope and no foot pedal and no transcriptionists. I have to say it was a little disruptive. It was a little disruptive. I wasn't here for the apps and, and, and full disclosure, I wasn't here for the full uh, go live, the, the, the full first day I was prairie dog hunting um, in South Dakota. So I, I sort of missed all the initial angst and trouble. <laughs> a lot of the bugs were worked out by the, by the, by the time I got back from that trip. But the, um, it was very disruptive. And I, it's funny, I thought, you know, again, now 25 years ago, we were deploying these telepathology systems all over the Army. I was a, I was a senior captain, but I was a captain. And I would call up full bird colonels and I would say, sir, you're getting a robotic microscope. You can send cases to AFIP. You can put it on the stage and you can go home and they'll look at it and send you a report by the morning. And these guys would say, look, you know, this all sounds well and good, but, you know, if it's not glass, you can kiss my ass. And um, <laughs> now 25 years later, I have to admit, I understand where they're coming from. I'm, I'm the age they were then. And, you know, look, look, like anything, um, after doing something repetitively day after day after day now for almost 30 years, to not have the foot pedal to not have your working drafts, to not have your pile of slides. It's a little disruptive, definitely. Fortunately, I think the technology is good enough that the, the transition was actually pretty seamless. And as I yeah, said last I month or earlier this month, digital pathology is just pathology. I don't think we have Yes, to, I saw that article as well. Know, it you know, is just pathology. It's just I pathology. I by it. So. I think... It doesn't really matter like which vendor, which technology. It has to match the speed of glass and it has to match the speed of microscope because I can totally understand somebody like you or, you know, any of my more experienced colleagues that have been doing this for uh, tens or for decades under the microscope and they take off the stage and they're super fast. I would be freaking annoyed if I had to work with something that's slower. I'm like, I want to get my stuff done. If this slows me down, I'm not going to use it. And so I totally get that point because, you know, I am not the most patient of people. And if I have that with any other technology, I'm like, no, I don't want it. Give me something else or I'm doing it the old way. Um, but obviously here I totally drank the digital pathology Kool-Aid and the technology is there right now. And um, so uh, lucky to, to be an advocate for something that's actually already good enough. No, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think you let good be the enemy of perfect. Um, I think you have to look at, and this is one of the big hurdles. And, and quite honestly, you know, I think if you had a full histology lab in your institution, as we did until last May, where you could smell the formalin across the hall and the xylene, and you could literally walk 50 feet and place an order for an immunistic chemical stain and get it that afternoon, it wouldn't make sense to have a scanner there and scan the slide and send the image across the hall. In a core lab model, which is increasingly becoming more popular, you're farther from where the slide is produced, you're mm -hmm. farther from where the patient is being seen, these networks are getting larger through mergers and acquisitions. So if you look at the total time, my argument would be, it may not be as fast as glass, um, putting a slide on the stage, in just rendering an image to the back of your retinas and making a diagnosis. But if you consider that you can scan a slide, for example, an immunistic chemical slide, and you're gonna get that two hours sooner than you would via a courier, particularly in bad weather like we had recently or something to that effect, then the total time to diagnosis is shorter. 
maybe even navigating it on the screen isn't as fast today. Um, but the total time to diagnosis, and we wrote a paper, I think, in you know, the late 90s doing robotic telepathology with frozen section. And certainly not as fast to click through each stage at that time with the static IP address and push and pull those images. But if you couldn't be there or you weren't available, then it's very reliable. And we now know that you know it's safe and reliable and accurate. Um, and we have the FDA studies since before that. So I think you have to look at the total time to diagnosis and your ability to do it. So, you know, we still do it only in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. We still do so it. So we don't the, do a remote sign out? We don't do remote sign out uh, outside of the hospital. So mm -hmm. the images are in another state, but um, in Indiana, but the um, all of our sign out is still done. And you know, of course, there's other issues, and folks have gotten around this or or implemented this, where you have your LIS remote, you have your images remote, and you have the securities in place and the control and access and so forth. We've made the decision to leave the monitors in the offices and leave the LIS accessible from your desktop and do it that way. So you know, I think we're checking all the boxes in terms of compliance there in a professional office setting. But, you know, I think as time goes on, that will evolve as well. And we'll take the lessons learned from these experiences and we'll continue to do that. But it's interesting, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And somebody told me this probably in 2008. I can remember very clearly. I was in the frozen section room late at night and somebody called and he said, when do you think this is going to all take off? And I said, you know, I always said five years, five years. And they said, look, it's never going to happen, Keith, until it's as fast as glass. And that was probably, you know, and to your point, I think that's accurate. But I think if you look at the total time to diagnosis, mm -hmm. as fast as glass might mean waiting two hours for a stain now or two hours for a batch of slides. And in that time, you can do quite a bit of work. So there have actually been a number of community practices in our system for the past several years um, now doing full digital. It's not the large academic medical centers. They've caught on now mm -hmm. since. But. Um, actually, the community guys started to. I have noticed this that. model as well, and the and the model with like there is a central histology that digitizes the slides, and an independent community practice uh, where the pathologists work remotely and um, sign out digitally. You know what I thought was uh, curious, because uh, that the CMS after the um, public health emergency. And that was, I think, last May. And they said, okay, pathology can uh, keep the remote sign-out, but not on glass. <laughs> the right. remote sign-out is actually only on digital, which I thought, that's that's interesting. I think, um, so when I was doing uh, the timeline, I mentioned the, the first like hurdle that I learned about was the pap mail scandal where people actually were able to take the slides home and it was in the environment that you have at home, you know, running kids and it resulted in too many false diagnoses. So that was like, Clea says, no way, no working from home. And here they say, yes, but no glass. <laughs> so that is cool. I like it. I, I think it's going to drive digital pathology even um, into more practices, into basically give people more access to care. No, we have to remind, we have to remind ourselves that uh, CLIA 88, uh, following CLIA 67, uh, stemmed from issues of remote sign out with pap smear screening and subsequent problems. So I think, I think we've taken those lessons learned and that's why we made the decision to leave it in the hospitals um, mm -hmm. on the compliant monitors and, you know, still having uh, access to your LIS. We don't have full LIS integration yet with our digital pathology system. That will come over time, I gather. But, you know, I think it's important to still be in a professional office setting. And again, you know, as I say, about one in five at a minimum, you still need your microscope. So, and you still need glass slides. So, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, it's uh, having made the change to get back to the original point, having made the change in May, um, it was pretty seamless uh, transition, even uh, now one of the older folks, but even the more older folks um, have just seamlessly adopted it. It's It's been very interesting to watch after, perhaps in retrospect, a lot of hand wringing. You know, are we going to see all the tissue? Is the color going to be accurate? Are we going to see the label? All of these issues um, that were addressed over the past two decades, it's it's fun to see it now in practice. 
cool. This is amazing. And so going back to tissue pathology, what are your plans for this year? What is the future of tissuepathology.com and beyond? Yeah, good, good question. And, um, you know, I had, I had uh, an introduction to uh, what we wanted to talk about today as I thought about this. The plan is uh, what the plan has always been. Uh, there is no plan. So uh, I don't really do any kind of strategic planning uh, in January of every year. Um, you know, we try to respond to the market. Um, a number of years ago, we changed the branding from digital pathology blog to tissuepathology.com and kind of changed that signage and that messaging because we were starting to get FDA approvals. Um, and it wasn't as focused on that. And now there's really neat other emerging technologies, genomics, proteomics. Mm -hmm. I've been ranting and raving, so to speak, about next-gen sequencing and molecular replacing morphology. So I think that's gonna be a hot button issue. Um, the term AI, machine learning, deep learning, what are the implications for that? Um, right now we have a terrible pathology shortage Maybe we won't have a terrible pathology shortage. And then what are the implications for AI or enhanced workflows or pre-screening algorithms? I mean, the AI thing is fascinating because, you know, we've been doing pre-screening automation on pap smears, you know, for more than mm -hmm. two decades when I was director of cytopathology. I know. We these were the first of the FDA cleared image analysis algorithms that were on pap smears and... Right. So we worked out, you know, the issues with liquid based cytology and monolayer technology, liquid based screening uh, for the purposes of finding the 22 most abnormal fields and then subjecting those to human overreads. Uh, and we've been doing that. As I say, we had we had thin prep screeners going back to 2000, 1999, 2000. So we've been doing that for decades. And now, you know, now we're going to hopefully start to do that in histology with some reproducibility and consistency in it. The data looks very good for that. So, but maybe it's also a term that's slightly overused in terms of what it can do and what it will do. And then um, as a number of folks have pointed out, the efficiencies that are gained by AI, what will you do with that extra time? Are those going to be protected hours where you can go back to the days where we could write papers and think critically about things? Or, you know, um, are they gonna give you 20, 30% more work, you know? So those are the kind of issues, but um, so, you know, kind of we go with the flow. I, I'm, pro I'm doing more original content than I have been historically. Mm -hmm. You mentioned content. Unfortunately, now we have enough dedicated, devoted partnerships with corporate sponsors who share their news. Um, so, you know, one criticism is that blogs are a news filter. Um, and we actually put that in our lessons learned that blogs are a filter. I actually like to think of blogs as an aggregator, as we do, mm -hmm. where you get the news of the day and you can go to one spot and see what the latest developments are rather than, you know, trying to search something in PR Newswire um, for mm -hmm. the news of the day and what the hot topic is. So I like to think of ourselves now as a news aggregator. I definitely see, I definitely use your platform like that. I basically open and see, okay, who did what? Uh, what's the and, and it's I like the new layout that you have as well and obviously this uh, link is going to be in the show descriptions and so I like that it's uh, these tiles and you can pick the one that um, you know you're most interested in so for me it's going to be AI it's going to be digital pathology it's going to be the partners that I also work with to see okay because I don't really have that news part uh, on my platform I have more the um, education opinion kind of uh, right. piece. So I definitely go to yours to check, okay, what's happened recently? Well, as I say, I think you found a niche and I think you'll continue to find your niche. Um, again, this has been a progress over 17 years, kind of finding a niche and worrying about what I was going to write day to day to fill up content and optimize the SEO and do all those things. So, um, you know, it's definitely a work in progress. But the plan is, um, there is no plan. So we'll continue to, to uh, hopefully uh, stick to the mission. The mission has always been the same since that June day in 2007 to educate and inform the pathology public. And um, that's what I'm going to strive to do every day. Thank you so much. You know what I see also those, the pathologists who also have like 
a different thing that they're doing. They all just love pathology and they love practicing pathology. And you never like stopped practicing pathology. And this came across today in the conversation, like, okay, if you uh, are thinking of doing this in order to monetize, just don't do it, right? You do it right. to um, because you have a mission, because you want to inform people. And I've seen that uh, across a couple of my guests that they like never gave up the pathology work. So right. thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, doing this for so long. Uh, we definitely need to meet again when you have the 20th anniversary of tissuepathology.com yeah. uh, to celebrate together. And I wish you a fantastic day. You too. Thank you again for the time and the opportunity. And thanks to everybody for listening. Thank you so much for listening to the end. You are a true digital pathology trailblazer, and you might have even started your digital pathology journey with Dr. Keith Kaplan's blog. But if you are a more visual learner, let me show you where you can find all the digital pathology place courses that are currently available, both free and premium, and where you can have access to your on-demand digital pathology education in one place. I'm gonna leave the link in the description below. So when you arrive here, all the free resources are at the top. We also have a bunch of free courses, including Digital Pathology 101 as an audio course. And when you sign up for any of them, they're gonna be added to your course library. And if you wanna check out the premium courses, here you will find a free trial of our premium memberships where you will find digital pathology information that are gonna help you succeed in any digital pathology endeavor. So go ahead, sign up for the courses, and I see you on the inside.